wars. You see all those things, and some of us have lived through those things. And, uh, and we start to doubt the goodness of God. But God is good. He's good all the time. And He's always faithful. And I can see His hand on my life, even in the midst of hard times, you know. Uh, Father's Day is coming up next, next week. It's quick. And, uh, you know, not everyone had a good father. And my father, I love my father dearly, but he wasn't, he wasn't a great father. Uh, but he was a father that God chose for me. And he's a my father for a reason. And, and my dad taught me a lot of things. He taught me things through good example, and he taught me things through bad example. And guess what? I taught my kids good things through good example, and I taught my kids things through bad example. And, uh, but I'm my kid's father for a reason. That's God's sovereignty chose, and hopefully our children will learn from our good examples and learn from our bad examples. But even no matter what's happening in life, God is always faithful. And so... As we look at the book of Revelation today, open your Bibles to chapter 18. And before we get started, does everyone have a cup? Communion Sunday this week, everyone have a cup if you need one. Raise your hand, and we'll get one to you. That way we can go into communion after the message uh, without interruption. Next month we'll start doing communion in the uh, traditional manner. So, uh, but this month we'll, we'll finish uh, this and... Anyways, Revelation chapter 18, we see the destruction of Babylon. It's something that's been a long time coming. Uh, we've seen in the book of Revelation, we've seen the rise of the Antichrist, we've seen the, the judgments of God falling upon the earth, destroying uh, most of creation, quite frankly. Uh, all the water's been destroyed. Uh, much of the plant life has been destroyed. Uh, much of humanity has been destroyed. At this point, humanity is down to about a quarter of what it was at the beginning of the seven years. And if God had not limited the tribulation to seven years, all of mankind would have been destroyed. But, but God is good, even in His judgments. And so, today we'll look at chapter 18, it is a rather lengthy chapter, uh, I'm hoping to get through it today, uh, but if not, we will follow up in a couple weeks, the week after Father's Day, but uh, let's just take a look at the first three verses and then we'll pray. It says, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon, the great, is fallen, is fallen, and has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for bringing us here this morning and for allowing us to, to be together, Lord. And uh, I ask that you would open our hearts to what you have for us. Lord, the book of Revelation is a, is a challenging book, Lord. It's challenging because uh, we take an interest in future things. It's challenging because we often look at the book of Revelation and see... Uh, the judgments that fall upon the earth and we're thankful that we're not going to be here but we should be challenged when we're not warning people of what's coming and Lord I ask that you would open our hearts today to see what is in your word and see how it relates to us even today Lord as we look and see what uh, how how the Antichrist how Babylon has deceive the world and the, the methods it uses and we see that those methods are, are alive and active today and, and becoming more and more profound. Lord, I just hope that you would open our spiritual eyes to see what we need to see to give us a sense of urgency, to warn others, to share the gospel, to 
to not be deceived by the world's way of thinking. And Lord, many in, in churches all across the America and across the world have, have been deceived by uh, well, uh, well-worded arguments, Lord, that have no real framework in, in the Word of God. And, and I ask that you would just not allow us to be deceived, Lord, not allow us to be complacent, Lord, that you would give a, a fire in our hearts that burns to share the gospel with others. In Jesus' name, amen. So in verses 1 through 3, we see the declaration. Once again, we see the declaration of the fall of Babylon. It says, in verse 1, it says, And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. So here's this angel. This angel with great power, the angel is not named. Uh, some believe that this angel is, is Jesus Christ himself. Uh, I don't believe that myself. They, they say that because of the, the, this angel having great power, that, that, he, that the earth is lightened with his glory, but you know, angels have power. Angels have glory. And so, I believe this is an angel, but not Jesus Christ. And this angel has great power, and he has a strong and powerful voice. It says, he cried mightily with a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen. Here's the, the reality of what Babylon is, is being declared. It is a fallen empire. It says it has become the habitation of devils, and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. The declaration is that Babylon has fallen. We are going to see the fall of Babylon in chapter 18. The fall of Babylon takes place in one day, in fact, the fall of Babylon, it can take, a, as we read it, we see that it either takes place in one hour or in three hours. And we'll see why I say that here in a minute, or a few minutes, I should say. But Babylon's fallen. It has become the home of all manner of wickedness. Babylon, while it's a real place, uh, spiritually speaking, is, is, is the source of all evil. Babylon is the is is the tabernacle, you might say. If there was a tabernacle or temple that was built for Satan, that's Babylon. All manner, it's a home of wickedness, all manner. It says is a habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. So there it is, devils, foul spirits. Unclean and hateful birth. Now, I want to park on unclean and hateful birth for a minute. My wife is shaking her head. She's going to have nightmares. She hates birds. And may I say this? You know, I, I love birds, especially chickens. Turkeys, tasty, pheasant, love them. But birds are disgusting creatures. They are. And if, you're, if you have a bird in your house, I apologize. But they're disgusting. I mean, these birds, they poop everywhere. In fact, they're malicious things. Because as far as I can tell, they target freshly washed cars, bald heads, and anywhere where I might put my hand to close the gate. <laughs> they're vindictive creatures. We have a bird that every year... Our back door, we have a canopy, and when you come out the door, there's a light right here, right about that high. And there's a little bit of space, about that much, between the bottom of the canopy and the top of that light, and every year, birds try to build their nest there. I thought I beat them last year. I, I would come home, and I, just, I mean, five, six, seven, eight times a day, and just go and you just clean out all the stuff they're building. You throw it down, and they, you know, go out an hour later, and there's more. And it's just this constant battle with these birds. This year, you know, I didn't expect to have any problem with the birds. And we didn't have any problem with the birds, except my neighbor cut down their trees. And all of a sudden, 
about a week before we left for the wedding, the birds are back. I come home, I, I leave for work, I tear it down. I come home, I tear it down and complain. Ruth complains that they tore it down four or five times while I was at work. And, you know, and we're doing this battle. The day we left for, for the wedding, I thought, you know what? We're going to be gone for three days. Those birds are going to have their nest there. They're going to have their eggs there. And, you know, I don't want to disturb their eggs. So, I guess I just lost this battle. We got home. There was not a piece of straw on that light. Good. Get up the next morning. Birds building a nest. They're just doing it to annoy me. And, and it's just constantly tearing it down. It, it slowed down a little bit. I think they're bored with the game. But birds are nasty, vindictive creatures. And there are also unclean birds. These are the birds that Israel was not allowed to eat. And Babylon is a habitation of those things. Babylon represents everything that is anti-God, anti-Jesus, anti-Christ. Not only that, but Babylon has, has, uh, has seduced the entire world. It is seducing the entire world now, and it will succeed in seducing the entire world in the, in the tribulation. It says, For all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are waxed rich through the abundance of her delicacies. Listen, all nations have partaken of her wine. What is this wine? It's the wine of her fornication. It's a wine of her ungodliness. It's a wine of her impurity. And when we see, when we look at the, the previous chapters of the book of Revelation, we see that it's wine that is really from the blood of the saints and martyrs. That Babylon is ultimately built on the, on the murder of God's people. All kings, it says, every, every, all, all nations, every single nation, you know, we, we have a tendency in America to say, well, you know, we're the greatest nation in the world, right? That's what we say. Guess what? The greatest nation in the world is going to, it, it, is going to partake of her wine. We're not going to be any different from anyone else. We, we as Americans need to get off of our of our prideful high horse and recognize that we're not any better than anyone else. I mean, we, have, we, we may have a, a better, in our opinion, form of government. We, we certainly have more freedom than mo most nations. But may I say this? We're not better than anyone else. What are we doing with our freedoms? Why did God give America the freedoms that it has? Because you know it comes from God. Our founding father said that. God gives us our freedom so that we can serve him. And what are we doing with it? Hard question. It's a question we don't really want to answer. Because what we're doing with it is we're doing whatever we want, but not what God wants. says, all the kings of the earth, every ruler, every world leader has fornicated with her. They're all in bed with her. Guess what? Guess who that includes? That includes our leaders. All merchants of the earth have gotten rich through her. Guess which, guess which merchants are included in that? All of them. I kind of gave up, I'll be honest with you, I, I kind of gave up uh, boycotting businesses. I, I've just given it up. And you know why I gave up? Uh, some of you are thinking, well, you, you, you're just a loser. You just, you're, just, you're just giving up on everything. I gave up because if I'm going to be consistent, I have to boycott everyone. 
There's no one I don't have to boycott. There's no business I don't have to boycott. Because if I dig deep enough in their finances, I'm going to see connections to ungodly things. And it may not be intentional, but it's there. And so, you know, where do I draw the line? Hmm. You see in verses 4 through 8 a warning to God's people. God, does, God warns his people. Why does God give us warnings? You know why he gives us warnings? Because we might do it. God doesn't give us a warning for something we can't or won't do. You know, when my kids are young, I had to tell them, don't touch the stove. Don't touch the hot oven. I had to give them a warning. And why did I have to give them a warning? Because they're going to touch it. But as they grow into teenagers, I don't typically find I have to tell my teenage and adult children, don't touch the hot oven. And when I do, if I do slip and tell them, don't touch the hot oven, you know what I get? <sighs> Dad, I'm not a kid anymore. I don't have to do it because they're not going to do it. But here, in verses 4 through 8, God gives his people a warning. He says, I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out from her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye be receive not her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Reward her even as she rewarded you, and double unto her, her double according to her works. And in the cup which she hath filled, fill to her double. How much she hath glorified herself, and lived deliciously. So much torment and sorrow give her, for she saith in her heart, I sit a queen and am no widow. I shall see no sorrow. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judgeth her. So here's this warning. God's, God gives us three warnings. His first thing he says, come out of Babylon. Abandon Babylon. Stay away from Babylon. Get out. Don't have, the second warning, don't have any part in her sins. Here's the thing is, sometimes we get, we get jealous, don't we? I know we don't want to admit it, but I think if we're honest with ourselves and honest with each other, we would say, you know what? I get jealous of the ungodly people. I get jealous when, I, when I'm sitting there. I'm working hard, and it's hard to live with integrity, and I'm trying to do the right things. I'm trying to be ethical and biblical in how I do things, and I'm struggling financially. I'm struggling with my health. I'm, I'm struggling... Uh, with my thought life, I'm struggling with all these things because I'm trying to live right. And I see all these other people out there. They're doing whatever they want and they don't seem to have my struggles. Have you ever thought of that? Has that ever occurred to you? It's discouraging. God said, but God says, don't have any part of her sins. And the third one, don't receive her plagues. If we partake in her sins, we're going to partake in her plagues. We're going to partake in the destruction that, that is going to fall upon her. And God gives his people this encouragement as he gives these warnings. He says, for her sins have reached into heaven, and God hath remembered her iniquities. Basically what he's saying is, Babylon's sin meter is full. We don't think about that very much, but God actually... And, and, and I use the term loosely because I don't know what God calls it. But, but there's a cup or, or, or some kind of measuring the device that God has that measures the sin of nations. Did you know that? It measures the sin of nations and he says, God, 
Her sins have reached to heaven. Her sins have, have built up. They're reaching all the way up to heaven. And God has remembered her iniquity. God doesn't forget. We often think, we get jealous of the world because we see how people are living and they're, they're, they're doing so well and they have more money and they have more free time and they're going on better vacations and they have nicer cars and they have, they have all the things that we wish we could have. And we get jealous because we struggle. Because we don't have that health that we think we should have as godly people. When you think that way, you're buying into this health and wealth gospel. You're, you're subtly telling yourself that if I'm good, if I do what God wants me to do, He owes me good health. He owes me a lot of money. He owes me all the comforts of life. But really, those are the things that the world leans on, not God. But God says, listen, I remember her iniquities. I see it. I'm not going to forget it. Turn, turn to uh, Psalm 73. Turn to Psalm 73. This idea of this jealousy of the world and the discouragement we have when, when we experience uh, life and we see how people who don't love Jesus, who, who don't love God, who, who want nothing to do with Him, we see how they're living life. And we think they have such a good life and ours is so terrible. It's nothing new. It's not an American phenomenon. It's not a 21st century phenomenon. It's not even a 20th century phenomenon. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament. Look at Psalm 73. We're not going to read the whole thing. It says, Truly God is good to Israel, even to such that there is a clean heart. That's what we say. God is good. God is good all the time. That's what we say. That God is good. He is faithful. But then we have verse 2. He says, But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps were well nigh slipped. I was losing my footing. For I, I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. It says, I saw these foolish, wicked people and I was jealous. I was envious. I wanted what they had. Because, why? It says, For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Their life seems great. Therefore, pride compasses them about as a chain, and violence covereth them as garment, and their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. They have everything you could desire. These ungodly, wicked people have everything that you can desire. That's what Babylon's going to be like. The end time, the tribulation saints are going to be able to look at Babylon. They're going to be see the prosperity of Babylon. They're going to see all this stuff, probably some great health and all kinds of other things, and they're going to be like, they're hiding, they're being killed, they're, they're hunted down, and they're looking at Babylon and saying, man, they, they have it so good. And it's, it's a problem that has existed forever. It says in verse 8, they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens, their tongue walketh through the earth. Therefore, as people return hither, and waters are full of a full cup are wrung unto them, and they say, How doth God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? They, they mock God. They want nothing to do with Him. They mock Him. It says, Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world because, uh, or prosper in the world, they increase in riches. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence. He's like, listen, I see all this stuff, and I start to think that I'm doing this all for nothing. It's an empty exercise for, to, for me to keep myself pure. It's an empty em em exercise for me to live right. This the Asaph, as he's writing this psalm, he is going through a deep depression, being jealous of what the world has seeing what the people who are not living for God have and compared to what he lacks. He's jealous of them. And he considers 
But all the works he's doing, all the worship he's leading, it all just seems empty to him. He says, and why? He says, for all the day long have I been plagued and chastened every morning. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should defend against a generation of thy children. He said, listen, you know, I wake up and I'm just plagued, I'm, I'm, I'm burdened all day long. When I talk to people, I, I, all I do is offend this generation. Everything I do is offensive. Everything I say is offensive. And, and people are against me. And I said, when I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. As I looked at this, it was just an exceeding amount of pain, exceeding amount of grief, exceeding amount of trouble. Then he says in verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. He said, that's what I thought until I, until I went to the sanctuary of God. When I went to the sanctuary of God, and may I say, it's not speaking of the church, but we can certainly apply it here. When I went to church, when I went and was among God's people, why do we need to assemble together? Why do we need to fellowship together? It's be, this is why. It's not just because God told us to. It's because this is where we strengthen each other. God made us social creatures. So when I went to the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. That's what we're looking at in the book of Revelation. The end of wickedness. The end of evil. What's going to happen? He says, surely thou didst sent them into slippery places, thou castest them down into destruction. How they are brought into desolation as in a moment. They're utterly consumed with terrors. I'm not going to keep going in that psalm, but you see that even Asaph, the psalmist, he's, he's going through these struggles and he's, he's discouraged because what he sees, he, he wants what the world has. And then when he turns his eyes to God, when he's with God's people, he understands that, yeah, they have it good now. But the time of reckoning is coming. God's going to reward Babylon for her iniquity. Not all rewards are good. There's a reward for those who live for Christ. And there are rewards for those who deny Him. One of them's good. One of them's bad. In fact, it says her rewards will be double proportion because her sin is double. She hasn't just got up to that sin meter and topped it off. She's, Babylon has exceeded it by two. By two. It's doubled it. She's lived a high life. She's glorified herself. She's lived luxuriously. She set herself up as queen. She believed she would never fall. She, she was never going to be a widow because she had all these other kings and fornicating with her. All these other kings in bed with her. All these other countries in bed with her. And she thought she'd never be alone. She'd never be a widow. But guess what? Verse 8 says, Therefore, in Revelation 18, verse 8, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day. One day. In a single day, all these Plagues, all these destructions are going to come, the ones we're going to see. Death and mourning and famine are going to be there. She's going to be utterly burned with fire. Fire is all consuming. You know, you ever, you ever see something that says it's fireproof? You know what's fireproof? Nothing. Nothing's fireproof. If the fire gets hot enough, it will burn. Steel burns if it gets hot enough. 
Iron burns if it gets hot enough. Everything burns if it gets hot enough. And the, the destruction of fire and Babylon is going to come. It's going to be all-consuming. Why? It says, for the strong is the Lord who judgeth her. Because the Lord God, the judge of all creation, is strong. There is none stronger. No one can, can beat the judgment of God. Nobody can beat his strength. He is strong. He is a judge. And guess what? I know there are people out there who say, God, God has no right to judge me. A, God does have the right to judge you. And B, the accused doesn't get to choose their judge. What would the American uh, justice system look like if the accused got to say, well, I don't want this judge, I want that judge. I mean, if I had an accused, if I, if, I were, if, if I were in the justice system and, I, and some, some guy said, well, I don't want this judge, I want that judge, I'd make sure they got this judge. <laughs> There's a reason why they want that judge. They don't get to choose their judge. God is the judge. In verses 9 through 20, we see the effects of Babylon's fall. We'll go through this quite quickly. Verses 9 and 10, we see the fall of human government, the, the effects of the king on the kings of the earth. It says, And the kings of the earth, who have committed fornication and lived deliciously with her, shall bewail her and lament her. When they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, thy great city Babylon, the mighty city, for in one hour is thy judgment come. These kings of the earth were in bed with her, and they're going to bewail and bemoan her, they're going to lament her, they're going to be sorry for her passing. This is the, the end of human government. Babylon at this point is running everything. All government is, is hinged on Babylon. And when Babylon falls, everything else, all the other governments fall with her. Take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. First Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 18, it says, For the preaching of the Christ cross to them uh, is to them that perish foolishness, but to us which are saved is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For after that in the wisdom of God the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And you can read that on and on. It talks about the, the foolishness of the world, that the wisdom of the world is going to come to naught. The, the world has become aligned on Babylon. And when Babylon is destroyed, there is no leadership left. The world's wisdom is destroyed. They've been relying on Babylon. They thought Babylon could not fall. And the fires of her destruction, when do they come? In one hour. One hour. Then we see the effects on the merchants of the earth, beginning in verse 11. And the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buyeth her merchandise anymore, the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet, all the uh, thine wood and all manner of vessels of ivory, all manners of uh, all manner of vessels of most precious wood, and of brass, and iron, and marble, and cinnamon, and odors, and ointments, and frankincense, and wine, and oil, and wine, uh, fine flour, and wheat, and beasts, and sheep, and horses, and chariots, and slaves, and souls of men, and the fruits of thy lust, uh, soul lusted after they are departed from thee, and all things which were dainty and good, goodly are departed from thee, and thou shalt find them no more at all. The merchants of these things which were made rich by her shall stand afar off for the fear of her torment, weeping and wailing, and saying, Alas, alas, that great city, 
that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. For in one hour, so great riches is come to naught. So we look and we see the merchants are going to mourn, they're going to weep. Why? Riches are gone. In one hour, God has destroyed the economy of the world. We were talking about that earlier out in the foyer about the dollar and how weak the dollar is. There's going to be a correction. I said, all this stuff we're seeing today, I've been saying this, all this stuff we're seeing is stuff that is leading up to the introduction of the Antichrist. Even the idea of the COVID vaccine. And it's not the vaccine itself, it's the idea that you're not going to be able to travel. The airlines are, are talking and saying they're not going to let people travel without, without the vaccine passport. Now, I know that's not the mark of the beast, but when you start getting businesses, airlines, other businesses that might follow suit, where you can't come in without having a vaccine passport, boy, doesn't that sound like, well, you have to have this to buy or sell. Just prepping us. It's preparatory. The, what happens if the American economy fails? Pretty much every other economy in the world is going to fail. What happens if all the economies in the world fail? The door opens up to one economy. To one currency. Hmm. Sound like preparation for the Antichrist? Nobody's going to be buying anything. There's no, the economy's gone. The riches are gone. There's one economy. When, it's, when their wealth is destroyed, it's all destroyed. No one's buying valuables. Nobody's buying, buying fine fabrics. Nobody's buying animals. And guess what else is big, big in the end times? <coughs> guess what else is big in the tribulation period? Human trafficking. Say what? Look what it says. Verse 13, and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. Human trafficking is getting bigger and bigger every year. Sounds like preparation for the Antichrist. Luxuries are all gone. The destruction of the riches that man has trusted in is gone, and it's all destroyed in one hour. We see the effect of sailors of the earth, and this speaks of those who transport these riches. It says, And every shipmaster and all the company all the company and ships and sailors, and as many as trade by sea stood afar off, cried, and when they saw the smoke of her burning, saying, what city is like unto this great city? And they cast dust on their heads and cried, weeping and wailing, saying, Alas, that great city, wherein were made rich all that had ships in the sea by reason of her costliness, for in one hour she is made desolate. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and ye holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. What happens to shipmasters? All these involved in transportation of goods they, they're crying, they're weeping, they're bemoaning the destruction of Babylon. Their wealth is gone. The commerce is no longer there. There's no more transportation needed because nobody's buying anything. You know, Babylon is made desolate in an hour. And guess where all these people were that Babylon was counting on? The kings and, and the merchants and the shipmasters. All these people that, that relied on Babylon, when Babylon is destroyed... They're watching from afar off. See, that's the thing. That's, that's the difference between the church and the world. Or it should be the difference, at least. Is the church is the body. The church is also described as a family. Family doesn't abandon family. It doesn't matter what happens. Listen, 
there's a history with me and my dad. I love my dad dearly, but there are some bad things that happened. But I can't abandon, I couldn't abandon my dad. There's history in my family where people have done wicked things. But I can't abandon my family. Because they're family. But these, they're not family. Babylon, for these merchants, these kings, these shipmasters, was a means to an end. And their means was destroyed. And the end they were hoping for was destroyed as well. Verses 21 through 24, we can see the description of the fall of Babylon. And a mighty angel, another angel, took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it into the sea, saying, Thus with violence shall that great city Babylon be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers and musicians and of pipers and of trumpeters shall be heard no more <clears throat> at all in thee. And no craftsman, or what, of whatsoever craft he be, shall be found any more in thee. And the sound of a millstone shall not be heard, uh, shall be heard no more at all in thee. And the light of a candle shall shine no more in thee, at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, and by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And... In her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. So the Bible, God tells us that if this angel takes this great millstone and it throws it into the water and it says, this is what the destruction of Babylon is going to be. You know the thing about just throwing a stone in, in water? It always goes fast. Have you ever tried to throw a stone slowly? doesn't work. If, if you try to throw it slowly, it just drops, but it still drops fast. And you throw, when you throw a great stone in water, what happens? You get this big wave, this big splash. And a, and a, a great stone like this, as I picture it, it's massive, you know, would create this massive wave. And it's showing, just speaking of the destruction, think about tidal waves we've seen in the last 20 years that have gone and devastated, destroyed, literally destroyed cities by a single tidal wave. And how sudden it was. They didn't know it was coming, and all of a sudden, there's a 50-foot wall of water crashing down on them that they never saw coming. That's a destruction of Babylon. It's a massive, sheer, violent, Destruction that comes suddenly. If you look at all these, it said these happened in an hour. Now, I don't know if, if these happened sequentially. I believe they all happened in the same hour. Some believe that, that all these three things happened sequentially, but it all happened really in an hour. It says and that the musicians are no longer going to serenade her. There's not going to be any craftsmen to serve her anymore. No production is going to happen anymore. There will be no more light in her. No marital joy will be found in her. There's nothing. It's going to be utterly devastated. Everything will be destroyed. And we see the nature of her iniquity here. Look at, look at verse 23. The, se the second half of verse 23. It says, For thy merchants were the great men of the earth, and for by the, thy sorceries were all nations. We look and think, oh look, they use magic. You know what the word for sorcery here is? It's a word for drugs. It doesn't mean magic. It talks, it's talking about pharmaceutical drugs. Think about what that means in our society today. That the world the kings of the world, all the people of the world were deceived by her sorceries, were deceived by her drugs. Does that ring any bells for anyone? And when I was 
a teenager, I never would have imagined that America would legalize marijuana, let alone legalize it recreationally. And what are we seeing these days? We have seen marijuana legalized across the world for decades, and now America is legalizing marijuana for recreational use. I have no problem with marijuana being used responsibly to treat illnesses any more than I have a problem with people using morphine to treat pain responsibly according to prescription. But man, marijuana recreational use, I guarantee there's going to be more drugs made legal for recreational use. And when it becomes legal for recreational use, boy, you got some control there. We're being deceived. The world is making well phrased arguments to legalize drugs. And the church is being deceived. And that's what the Antichrist uses. You say, oh, uh, is, is, is recreational marijuana going to bring in the Antichrist? No. Probably not. But you know that once that's legalized, there's going to be others legalized as well. It's a doorway. It's opening that door to the Antichrist. We see it today. It's here. All nations are deceived by her drugs, by her sorceries. She's killed prophets, saints, and others. And basically, what this is saying is every person who has died of, of, of violent death was brought on by Babylon. When Cain killed Abel, it was brought on by the spirit of Babylon. And it has ever since. Ultimately, the untimely deaths of all these people is what sustained Babylon. Let me ask you this. Look around. Look around at the world today. See what's happening in the world today. See it with spiritual eyes. What's taking place around us? Take notice of the preparations the world is making for the coming of the Antichrist. For the coming of his kingdom. The warning God gives us is don't be deceived by the world's wisdom. The world makes a convincing argument because they have the flowery words. Don't buy into the world's way of thinking. Ask yourself this, this is a question I've been asking for, for many, many years. What does the Bible say? Don't ask yourself the same questions we've been asking ourselves over and over again for decades. How have I been taught? That's a terrible question. Because if how I've been taught is different from what the Bible says, I've been taught wrong. Don't ask yourself, how have we always done it? Because if how we've always done it is contrary to what the Bible says, how we've done it is wrong. We have to stop buying into our wisdom and start buying into God's. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. And I ask, Lord, that you would be with us now as we partake in the Lord's Supper, that you would help us to examine our hearts, Lord, that we would examine our, the way we look at things and that we would recognize uh, that we're not looking at things the way you want us to look at them oftentimes, but we're looking at things the way we've been taught We've been looking at things through flowery arguments of the world, Lord, that uh, sound so much better than anything I could say, Lord, but, but we need to look at your truth and the truth of your word to lead us and guide us, to direct us, Lord. Even when the whole world stands against us, Lord, we need to stand with you. In Jesus' name, amen. First Corinthians chapter 11. Speaking of the Lord's Supper, it says this, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. 
For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. As we prepare to partake in the Lord's Supper, I would remind you, the Lord's Supper does not save us. We don't believe that the Lord's Supper, that we partake of this wafer, that it becomes a literal body of Christ. It is a, that it is a picture of the body of Christ. It is unleavened bread, because leavening oftentimes, more often than not in Scripture, represents sin. And he had no sin in his body. He had no sin in him, but the sin of the world was laid upon him. The, the juice does not become blood, but it's a representation of, of his blood that was shed for us. And the Bible tells us that we need to partake of this in a very serious manner. I'm a, I'm a kidder by nature. I mean, I'm, I'm usually joking around about everything, but this is not a laughing matter. The Bible says that we should not partake of this in an unworthy manner. Meaning, first of all, we need to be saved. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your Savior, then I ask you not to partake in this. A better way of handling would be, instead of not partaking, would be to just come up and let me know that you need to be saved. And I'll be happy to let one of my deacons handle the service and I'll share with you the gospel. Don't partake if you're involved in known unrepentant sin. Or better yet, repent of your sin partake. In order to examine ourselves and make sure that we are partaking in a worthy manner, we're going to take a few moments to examine our own hearts, to pray, and ask God uh, to help us to deal with sins that we need to deal with, and then we will continue as we pray silently. Lord, I thank you for this day, and I thank you for bringing us here today. Lord, I thank you for your blood that was shed for us, for the body that was tortured and tormented for us, Lord, that was shredded by the whips and the thorns. Lord, the torture you endured for us. I ask as we partake in this that you would help us to partake in a manner that is worthy of you, partake in a manner that is consistent with your will and your character, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen. It says in verse 23, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, that same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also, 